or the Son of God. Amen. All right, well, that's good. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs with me this morning, chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter 8. And in verse number 22, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse number 22, the divine text says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ere the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with waters, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the, dip, of the depth. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Father, bless that word now. Give me unction to preach it. In your name I pray, amen. Now everything that you're going to deal with is a spirit being. And as Christians and Bible believers, we should be fully informed about the spirit world. You should never be taken aback by the fact that when you come into the house of the Lord like this morning, no telling how many spirits are in here. No telling. There's no telling. But we do know this, that we do know that if Christ is exalted, he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. We know, therefore, by experience and by scripture, that to preach the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring the right spirit into a church house. And that's very important. Because the right spirit makes all the difference in the world, as I said to you. This wisdom that we read about here in the psalm, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 8, has to do with the wisdom that was with God before he made anything. And this is the wisdom that he delighted in, the fact that, you see, God knew exactly why he made us and why he made creation, and he rejoiced in it in his own soul. He took great pleasure in the fact that he was about to do something that would manifest his wisdom. And it's for us to understand today that this is not an accident. There's a reason for us being here. You think about this planet that's out here by itself, this beautiful blue planet, as you look at it from space, it's a wondrous thing. You ought to see some of the photographs that's been taken. And But you look at it and you think to yourself, there's, it's the only one around. There's no life out there anywhere else. Though they try long and hard to find it, there's no life out there. And the reason for that is because it is here on this planet that God gets the issue of sin settled and the issue of man's relationship with God. It'll be taken care of right here. And this place was made for man. It was a, it's made for man and we're able to, to flourish here and we're able to continue here because he made it for us. But there's wisdom in it. Now the Bible said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that upbraideth not, giveth to all men liberally. I want wisdom. I know a lot of people with a head full of knowledge, but no wisdom. In other words, push the button and you're listening to a dictionary. Or push, push the button and you're listening to an encyclopedia. Well, you can get that from any machine. But wisdom is something that is the gift of God. And that's something we need. As we open the Bible, begin to read the pages of the Word of God, we're led by the Spirit into the wisdom of God. And that begins to open up something for us that is not superficial. It's not on the surface. But it, it's something that makes you think. And I want you to think. Because that's what adds, uh, that, that gives spice to life. That gives, you, that gives depth to our meaning. That, that sets us apart from the animal creation. The fact that, that we can think. We can think into something. We can have abstract thoughts about something that may not be before us. But we know it's there. And we're not living for the moment. We're living in a world. And we know where we came from. We know where we are. And we know where we're going. And we know why it's all here. That's wisdom. And wisdom as it relates to all kinds of things is another message in itself. But I've got to move along from this point. But I want to make it with you this morning. Wisdom. In the book of Job chapter 38 and verse 4 it says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. 
Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? <laughs> when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I'd like to have been there when the angels saw creation come into existence because he made them first. It appears that the angels were present and they watched all of this just all of a sudden explode before their very eyes. My, it, it had to take them. It had to move them. It had to stir their heart and their soul. And the more that God reveals of himself, the more you marvel at his existence. Amen. And this is that wisdom I'm talking about this morning. You say, well, I, you know, I, no, 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 we really don't understand to tell you the truth. We are so limited in what we know. The truth of the matter is, really the only real thing we know about God is when God manifested himself in flesh 2,000 years ago. We know him. We know him. We know the God man. Oh, yeah. God manifest in flesh 2,000 years ago. Sinless, perfect God came into this world, came to a creation and he lived amongst his creatures and he breathed the air that the creature breathes and he ate the food that the creature eats and he died to death that the creature dies. But death couldn't hold him. On the third day he arose from the dead and ascended back into the presence of that eternal, absolute, invisible being that cannot be known except through his son. So all we know about God right now is through the son and that's the way he meant for it to be. For the day will come when you'll know more about him. And the more you know about him, the more it's going to blow you away. The more you know about him, the more you're going to have to prepare yourself for what you see. Don't think now, my dear friend, that you've got him half figured out because there's an awful lot to this being that we call God this morning. An awful lot. So the angels shouted. <laughs> they were taken aback. They literally were blown away. And I suppose I would have been too, wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> Amen. All of a sudden, a universe comes into existence. You didn't make this little bit there and create that little bit here. No, no. Bang! There it was. Brought it forth. Bara is the Hebrew word for creation. And it means to bring into existence from nothing. He didn't need anything. He brought it all into existence. What are you here for? Have you ever thought about that? Isaiah chapter 14 says this. Don't you think about this. For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now what a thing. You notice there's no fornication in here. Nobody's drunk. You notice that? There's no blasphemy going on in here. This is high spiritual sin, folks. This is the high stuff. This is the spiritual stuff. This is the kind of thing that the natural, you know, you know, the very shallow life that people live. Uh, they see this, they see that, and they think that's all there is to it. My dear friend, sin goes much deeper than what the eye can see. Make no mistake about it. And what brought this creature down was when he said, I'll be like God. Now, whatever his motive might have been, we'll let the Almighty judge that motive. But I know this, he brought him down. He brought him down. But keep this in mind. Keep it in mind. God allowed that. He allowed it to happen. He allowed it to come. And you live in a world that's shot through with sin. You live in a world, my dear friend, that, that is the servant of sin. You live in a world where the God of this world is the master of sin. The Lord said in John 8, said he was a murderer from the beginning in a boat not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he was a liar and he is a liar. This is Satan, my friend. This is Satan we read about in Isaiah 14. But in the Old Testament, in book of Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. There's no question that the angel of the Lord in Genesis 22 is the Lord. Now, sometimes the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of holiness, not necessarily the Lord personally himself. But here, it's the Lord. Yes, sir, it's the Lord. And so here we have an angel showing up in the Old Testament called the angel of the Lord. Remember these angels who all of a sudden they've been created and here they are and just, 
All of a sudden, all this creation just bang, explodes right in front of them. And they must have shouted. They must have shouted for joy. You see, folks, follow along with me. God is progressively revealing something about himself. We can't handle it all at one time. The Lord Jesus said, there are many more things that I'd like to say to you, but you're not ready for it yet. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Heaven, my dear friend, is not so much a place as it is a person. The place just happens to be there for us, not him. He has existed long for eternity before any place ever existed. He needs no place. He's the Almighty. And so he tells us here in Numbers chapter 24, the Old Testament scripture, and it's a prophet. His name is Balaam. And the Bible said he took up this parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Now watch what he says. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Here we have a prophet in the Old Testament talking about a star appearing. If you'd had a Bible, you'd have believed it, folks. Do you believe your Bible? He said a star is going to appear. I don't know that when Christ was born 2,000 years ago, a single Jew was looking for a star. But I know the wise men were. The Magi were. Yes, they were. And they were in the east. They were there where the children of Israel had been in Babylonian captivity. And it was there the Babylonian Talmud became, it started, it, it started in, in its formation. And it was there, no doubt, Scripture was written. The book of Daniel was probably written there in that captivity in that time. The book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and other books that were written there. And Daniel talks about the birth of the Messiah. And he says, 70 weeks are to turn upon thy people. And we can get into all that. But the bottom line is he told them when he would be born. And so they understood that. They realized that. These wise men from the east had a date set for them. He's coming at a certain time. And they're looking for his star because they, they read what Balaam had to say. Surely God showed them. It shows me that the people that don't have the word of God, but they have the light that God puts in their soul, it tells me there are people out there that are far more interested about their soul and about the truth and about the word of God than most of the people in this country. We're jaded. We come to church week in, week out. We read scripture, we pray, we go, through our, we go through all this stuff. And yet it doesn't mean a thing to most people. They walk out the church door and they go back out into the world and become secular once again. They may have been religious for a little while on Sunday. But there are people out there that would love to have half of what we have in this country. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had had the preaching that you've had, he said they would have long ago repented in sackcloth and ashes. To have the word of God is a blessed thing. It's a precious thing to take this scripture and hold it in your hand and say, this is God's word. I've got the light. Yes, I do right here. I've got the light. This is the wisdom of God. Amen. This is a road map for life. That book right there. And so we read about another prophet and we find him in John chapter number 11 and verse number 51. I want you to look at this prophet. John eleven fifty one. 51. He's quite a prophet. You'd have never thought he'd be a prophet. Some of you probably already know where I'm headed. But you think about this prophet in John 11, verse number 51. Now, if you look at verse number 49 of John chapter number 11, one of them named Caiaphas. See that? That's the high priest. All right? Being the high priest that same year said to them, you know nothing at all. Now, I want you to come down to verse 51. Well, let's go ahead and read the context, verse 50. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now look at verse 51. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he what? What did it say? He prophesied. Here's an unbelieving high priest that God used to prophesy. 
Well, I've never heard such a thing, preacher. Don't you believe in the sovereignty of that almighty being that we serve? Don't you understand that from the rocks he could raise up those who cry out and shout the glory of God? Do you realize that the king's heart's in the hands of the Lord? He can do anything he pleases, folks, and he doesn't have to check in with anybody. He's God. He made Caiaphas a prophet for just a little while. An unbeliever became a prophet. Now that messes up an awful lot of theology. Boy, does that ever blow a lot of, you know, God won't use an unclean vessel and this and that. You hear that stuff preached here and there and here and there and here and there. But you just read something in the Bible that kind of blows it away, doesn't it? So what does that do for you, preacher? It says, I believe the Bible. And I may not have all the T's crossed and all the do I's dotted. And I may not have everything exactly where it belongs. You know, a lot of people think life is like a huge jigsaw puzzle. And you've got to put all the pieces together. And if you don't get all the pieces put together, you never will figure out life. No, just leave it to one that gave you life to begin with. He'll take care of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Amen. He will. He does a good job of it. So Caiaphas was a prophet. Yes, and they found his uh, ossuary too, by the way. And they found it there in the valley of, uh, of, of Gehenna. And they found his ossuary buried his bed back in a cave. And what's an ossuary? An ossuary, they took the body 2,000 years ago and they laid it out and let it uh, go back to dust. Then they took the bones and they put them together, them together in a box. It's got a bone box, an ossuary. And, uh, and it had some beautiful uh, 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 geometric signs on the side of it and all of that. But it was Caiaphas. Right there was physical evidence that this man lived 2,000 years ago just like the Bible said he did. And it was a big deal when that happened about 20, 25 years ago when they found that. That was a big deal because that was an extra biblical source to the historicity of the Bible. Amen. The Bible can be believed, folks. It can be believed. So what are you leading to, preacher? Well, why don't you look at something? Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. That gives me warmth. I love to hear that. I sat this morning for two hours and listened to Christmas carols. Oh, it's wonderful. Turn the lights out, you know, build a fire. Yeah, turn, light a candle and just sit there in the dark and listen to the songs and listen to them as they glorify. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You say, crazy preacher, I'm happy and crazy. Amen. That's all right. Hallelujah to God. I really did. I, I enjoyed it so much. The Bible says there in the, in, the, in, the, in the country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, the goal... Uh, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Well, now, I want you to watch what happens here. In Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east or come to worship him. Now chronologically, these wise men show up a couple of years after his birth. He's not in the cave. He's not, he's not in the manger. They come to a house. You all know that if you've read your Bible. You know that. I know it's a beautiful scene to see the wise men and the shepherds and all of that around. That's all beautiful. That's all fine. But, his, but uh, scripturally, the wise men didn't show up until later. And they come. Where is he that is born king of the Jew? For we've come to worship him. So they're going to worship the Jewish king. I'm going to worship him this morning too. Jewish king. Hebrews 1, 6. Now watch this. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now the angels knew the scripture because they read the scripture. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter that the angels desired to look into these things that were prophesied. And they were not allowed to see them at the time. You see, the source of your truth, my dear friend, does not come from angels. The apostle says in the book of Galatians, in the book of, uh, in, in the book of Colossians, do not be deceived by an angel. He said, in, if, if I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which has been preached, let him or that angel be anathema. Let them be cursed. Don't let them change the gospel. 
Say, what if they're beautiful? What if they've got a halo? What if they've got shining aura around them? What if you can feel the wind of glory? I mean, what if you see all of this magnificence and this angel stands before you and says, let me tell you now, the gospel has been adjusted a little bit for this age in 2023. And let me spell out the gospel for you. The apostle Paul says, let them be damned. Care how beautiful they are if they come to change the gospel. So these angels are watching. Now follow me. The angels believe the scripture. They're watching. And the Bible tells us that the Lord said, if you are an angel of God, make your choice. When that child is born, you worship him. Now that had never happened. They had nothing to compare it with. You got all these angels that are looking for a child to be born. What, what's going on here? Well, this is God incarnate in flesh. Angels don't worship angels. Angels don't worship people. Angels worship God. Make your choice. Now look how it happens. Look how it happens in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. That's where a shepherd belongs. He's with his flock. If he runs off and leaves his flock, he's a hireling. He doesn't care about anything about his flock. And the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of, in the, in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now watch this. The angels have heard all this. They're watching this. Now look at this. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. <laughs> Amen. When the word went forth, child's born, the angels, hallelujah. Let them worship God. They did. They worshiped the son. Yes, sir. They fell down before that little baby right there. You remember the one Simeon held up in his hands? He said, there in mine eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Now, this is the book of salvation. But my dear friend, the actual salvation itself is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son hath not life. Simeon got it right. So did Anna. He held up that little baby and says, Mine eyes are a hold. I'm a hold of the salvation of the Lord. These angels worshiped God, boy. They worshiped him. Amen. And just move over and let me join up with you. I worship him too. Don't you know that? I worship that babe that was born in a manger. Yes, sir. Get me a place to fall down. But you see, the thing is, he's not in the manger anymore. But he was laid in a manger. Now look how this works. John chapter number one and verse number nine. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I mentioned the other day and I mentioned it again this morning. Hyper-Calvinism is, uh, is defined by an acronym of, called TULIP. That's an acronym. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, predestination. These are the five pillars of hyper-Calvinism. Now my dear friend, here's the problem with that. The problem with hyper-Calvinism is that if you are not one of the elect, then it makes a difference what you do, the choices you make, whatever, you're headed for hell. That God chose before you were ever made, before the foundation of the world, to save certain and damn others. That's hyper-Calvinism. The Bible says that he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He doesn't light a man if that man is condemned to damnation and hellfire. In plainer words, in plainer words, total depravity is not a scriptural doctrine. You are accountable for the light that you have and the light you reject. And there's the problem. And so this is what you do this morning. Do you want the light? He had a confrontation with a man. His name was Pilate. In John 18, when Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Now watch this. Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Isn't that a fair question? 
In other words, are you just performing your job as the procurator? You know, officially you're in this position. Officially you ask these questions. You have to do it as part of your job. Or do you really want to know? And some of you run around, you hide behind people, and the man upstairs, and this and that, and blame everything under the sun except yourself for your problems. You do. You hide. You hide behind people. You make every excuse there is, you know, for not believing. And you feel comfortable in that fact that you've made all these excuses and you refuse to accept the truth. But the bottom line is, we must give an account of ourselves. Pilate, do you want to know that? That's the question. Do you want to know it? Wasn't well, that quite an offer? I mean, he was offering him something. He said, if you want to know it, I'll tell you. But if it's simply, you know, for novelty's sake or for curiosity, I'm not obligated to give you anything in curiosity. See? No. In other words, do you want the truth? Do you want it? Well, let me tell you what the truth is. The truth is written down in Scripture. But if you really want the truth, the truth is a person. So what's that mean? It means this. It means that you may not ever th know everything that you can know about the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know the truth. You may not have all the facts about all the truth that's related to him and all the truths in the scripture and all of that. And these are wonderful things if you know them, but you may not know them. And I doubt if anybody knows all of them. But the bottom line is, do you believe on the Son of God? Then you believe the truth. To accept the Lord Jesus Christ is to accept the truth of God. To reject him is to call God a liar. That's what God said in 1 John 5. If you don't believe on the Son, you're calling God a liar. You've rejected the witness and the record that God gave of his Son. And so therefore to, re to refuse Christ, my dear friend, is to refuse the truth. You say, well now, you know, I'll fit him into my religion. He becomes part of my religion. We appreciate him. He's a, he's a great prophet. He's a teacher, you know, and all these things. Work, he even worked miracles. Praise God for him. I mean, he showed us the way, this and that. We, we emulate his life. We live after Christ. Is the, is, is we, we're disciples of Christ. We follow in his steps and all of that. That's a bunch of high sounding nothing. He that hath the Son hath life. If you receive the Lord Jesus Christ today, you're saying to God, I believe the truth. And I'm, I'm accepting the truth as much as I understand of it, as much as I can understand, as much as I can know right now. I'm accepting the truth. And here's the thing. There's not a, one of us in this house, if you've been saved for any length of time, you receive the Lord Jesus and you receive the truth of God, but you know a whole lot more now about that truth than you did when you first received him, right? Yes, you do. And you found that he's true in every sense of the word. Yes, he's truth. Pilate said in John 18, what is truth? All right, that's a relative term. That's what he sees thinking and philosophically, Pilate is. What is truth? Can there be anything as an absolute truth? Your religion is good as my religion. My religion is good as your religion. We're all going up a mountain. You're coming up this side that way, and you're coming up that side that way, and you're coming up that side that way. We're all headed to the top. We all mean well. It's all the same. No, it's not. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved because he's the truth. He's the truth. The Bible says in Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 10, God says, prove me. That's quite a thing. You read about that and it says that's one of the rarest things in the Bible. God prove, prove, tests us. He tests us all the time. He puts us to the test. You'll be going through the test. If you're not going in right now, you will. Or you may be coming out. You may be in the midst of it. But he'll try you. He'll test you. He doesn't test you for him, so he'll find out anything about you. He'll test you and put you through it so you'll find out something about yourself. You'll find out what you're made out of. All right? And I could give you example after example, but I'm not going to get into it because it takes a lot of time to do all that. I want to try to move through the message this morning because there's some things I want to show you. God will try you by the living, by the life you live. He'll try you. Genesis 48, he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abram and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've thrown away more than my grandfather ever had. I have. I got more junk piled up around me that he never saw a day in his life. My grandfather never had anything like that. Well, you say, why do you mention your, he's my daddy. He's the one that raised me. My grandfather raised me. That's the only daddy I ever knew. 
He loved me and gave me a home. I stood at his door when I was a little over four years old, and my little one-year-old brother, a little over one-year-old, I stand at his door, knocked on his door. He came to the door and opened the door, and he let us come into his house, and he gave us a home. Now, that's how I grew up, and I thank God for it, because I had first cousins that grew up over here at John Tarleton. How many's ever heard of John Tarleton? You know what John Tarleton is? All right. They grew up over there. I grew up in the home of my grandfather. God's been good to me. He's blessed me. He's been good to me. He's been real good to me. He's fed me every, every meal I've ever had. I'm, I'm stand before you this morning, I can say I'm thankful. I am, man, I am. I'm thankful. I could have died on Clinton Highway about, oh, I don't know, 50 years ago, whenever it was, pulled out in front of a car, got knocked 15, 20 feet straight up in the air out of a motorcycle. My boots still stuck in that motorcycle. My boots were stuck in the motorcycle, but I was gone into the air, fell over on the ground, got up, got my motorcycle, and drug it out of the road. How many people would have died with a lick like that? God was good to me. He was good to me. He's been good to me, folks. I'm thankful to him. If I drop dead today, I can say, Lord, as I leave this world, thank you. You've been good to me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God's been good to me. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? Are you really thankful? Are you thankful for what God's done for you? How many's ever heard of Lou Wallace? How many's ever heard of Ben Hur? Sure you have. Most of you probably seen the movie. I've seen it two or three times. It's a good movie. It's quite a thing. Uh, ben Hur was written by Lou Wallace, who was a major general in the Civil War, and he was a, a agnostic, I suppose, maybe even an atheist. He set about to prove that there was no Christ and prove the Bible was, uh, you know, historically inaccurate and all this made-up thing. And he did what all the rest of them do. He started digging. That's a big mistake. Big mistake. He started digging. And it wasn't long before he wasn't doing the digging. The digging was digging him. It was opening up his soul. You know what happened? He got saved. And Ben-Hur was written in the 1800s. And it was the most popular of a whole century, the most popular movie at that time, book, in the 1800s. Lou Wallace got saved. You know why? Because he was confronted with the truth and he had to do something with it. Who's the truth? The Lord Jesus. Lee Strobel, have you ever heard of him? He's an apologist, all right? And he's a good one. His first book was The Case for Christ. In it, he gives his testimony. Well, he was an atheist, very smart man. He's research. Uh, he was a, uh, a, what do you call it, research journalist, investigative journalist, I think is the term for it. So he knows how to research. And he began to dig. He's going to disprove, you know, the Bible and all that. What happens? Same thing. Same thing. He got saved. And boy, did he ever get on fire for God. They say he's written over 20 books. I've got two or three of them. They're good, good stuff. Say, so what's an apologist? An apologist is someone who goes back, takes the historical material, and he gives you the reasons to believe, the historical accuracy of what you're looking at. You see, that's an apologist. Now, don't misunderstand the word. That doesn't mean he's making an apology for what he's doing. <laughs> it's just simply a word in the dictionary used to describe someone who lays the foundation down for why you should believe. And he's a good one, Lee Strobel. How many's ever heard of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer? Yeah. yeah, you have. He's the kind of guy you hear about him, makes you sick, doesn't it? You know what all he did? Sick, man. Sick. But did you know that he got saved in prison? Yeah, it's quiet, isn't it? That's hard to believe, isn't it? That's hard to believe somebody that could be so vile, such a reprobate, could be saved. But here's the problem. This is the problem with Jonah. This is the Jonah syndrome. So what's the Jonah syndrome? Our brother preached. You preached on Jonah the other night. You remember that? Jonah said, now, Lord, I told you when you wanted to send me to Nineveh, this is the enemy. This is the enemy city. This is their capital. What are you sending me there for? I knew I know you. You're long-suffering. You're merciful. You'll forgive them. And I didn't want to go. <laughs> That's what it said. He reminded the Lord that the Lord will save anything. He'll even save your enemies. 
Amen. 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 And he saved Jeffrey Dahmer. How many ever heard of David Berkowitz? Son of Sam. Yeah, he used a 44 special. That's a lot of you know. If you know weapons, you know what that is. And he killed a bunch of people with that. Killed them. Murdered them. He was a serial killer. Oh, you talk about rabid and crazy. He was. But you know what happened to him? He got saved. David Berkowitz, still locked up in prison, probably be there the rest of his life, but he met the truth. You see, all he had ever done is live a lie all of his life. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, everything you hold precious and everything you live for and everything that, that means life to you is a lie. Amen. Amen. And then Carla Faye Tucker. She was dear to my heart there for a while. Bless her heart. How many ever heard of Carla Faye Tucker? Few of you have. You know what she did? She got so high on dope one night, they burglarized a home. She took a pickaxe. And she killed two people with a pickaxe. Yeah, that's tough stuff, right? And a lot of people came to her uh, defense. They loved her because she got saved. She really got saved. And she became a witness, an evangelist in prison. Went from one to the next. And so a movement was afoot back in the 19, 1990s for the governor of Texas. At that time, his name was George Bush. To, to at least, you know, she had a death penalty. Uh, to at least remove the death penalty and let her live out her life in prison. And, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And so she died. But before Carla Faye Tucker died, she had a smile on her face. And she said, this is the will of God. She says, I deserve to die for what I did. But I'm going to heaven. Amen. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> so we'll meet Jeffrey Dahmer. We'll meet uh, David Berkowitz. We'll meet Carla Faye Tucker. You're going to meet some of the sorriest low-down garbage that ever walked the face of this earth. But they got born again. And some of these nice, sweet-sounding Christian people that come to church every Sunday that wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't touch some of this stuff. You may not meet them, dear friend. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save what? Of whom I was chief. There you go. I'm glad you caught me. So you're listening. Of whom I am chief. Amen. So what's the story of Christmas? The story of Christmas is Carla Faye Tucker. The story of Christmas is David Berkowitz. The story of Christmas is Jeffrey Dahmer. The story of Christmas is Lee Strobel. The story of Christmas is Lou Wallace. <laughs> and the story of Christmas is Charles Lawson. <laughs> I'm here this morning because I got a hold of the truth. Amen. I don't know everything about the Lord Jesus, but I know him. And I've received the truth of God. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you received the Son of God? Because if you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you may have elements of truth, but you don't have the truth. You have to have the person of Christ to have the truth. He is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you know him? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray to use what little I've said in here this morning. Somehow or another, to give glory to God and to exalt the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, who deserves all of our praise and our honor and our glory. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us this morning. Help us glorify the Son of God and lift him up. Help us point men and women to Christ. He is the only answer. He's the truth. In Jesus' name. Now, heads are bowed. Nobody looking. Would anybody raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher, don't you pray for me because I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I believe. I guess I believe in Christ, but I'm really not even sure what I believe in Christ. I'm not even sure really what I believe. Tell you the truth, I live. it's so confusing anymore. Religious scene in this country. Yes, sir, I believe it is. It is confusing. Do you know him? Do you know whom I have believed? Do you know him? God bless you. Anybody raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher? I'll pray for you right there. Hands up. Anybody else raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher? Father, Lord, we had folk raise their hand. Nobody's going to pressure anybody here, Lord. 
That's the work of the Holy Ghost. And you lead them by your Holy Spirit. But, oh, God, oh, Holy One, you've already made the first move, our Father. And you've moved in their heart, moved in their soul. And they've raised their hand today to acknowledge that they want to know more. And the Bible tells us we'll know more. We'll know if we follow on to know the Lord. We'll know more. And, Lord, help them. God, give them what they need. Show them, Lord. Move in their heart. Move in their soul. Draw them close to thee. Move about their spirit. Oh, God, put your arms around them. Let them know that you're a friend of sinners, our Heavenly Father, and then you're the Savior of mankind, and that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, God bless you. Stand up this morning let's sing. What have we got, brother? Page 375 of the church hymn.